What's going on, everybody? Uh, welcome to the Get Stuff Done podcast presented by OMES. It's a podcast here where we're able to just take some time, set aside, learn about all the different individuals and entities within our state government and even outside our state government who serve Oklahomans. So with us today, of course, we have Director Steve Harp, who is the director of OMES. And our guest this week is Justin Brown, who is the director of DHS here in Oklahoma. So Justin, welcome to the show. Hey, yeah, welcome. You. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. Being the first ever on the show. That's right. I mean, I'm humbled. I'm honored. Like, you guys are celebrities now. <laughs> and, <laughs> How about that? Yeah, and I'm just trying to keep up. So we're going to set a bar really low. No, just kidding. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, that's, that's the no trick pressure. of show biz. That's right. right. It's to set the bar really Kinda low. Set, we first. don't know if you're the first victim or the first guest. We, we didn't know what to label All you. Right. So we'll, I guess we'll be able to tell after the show. How about that? Sign me up for either one. <laughs> so what was really cool about this is... Well, a lot of what a, a lot of people don't know is when I first got to state government in October, that OMES ISD specifically did not have a great relationship with DHS at the time. And matter of fact, I was like begging to get a meeting with with, with Mr. Brown here, and it was not hard. But he, he eventually did decide to see me, and then I met with I don't know if you remember this meeting. It was me, you, Samantha, okay, and I think the um, the team that you have that was doing the bots were in the room oh, as yeah, well. Oh yeah, okay, great. And they, it was it was a little bit of a bloodbath, but the cool thing was they let me talk for a few minutes, and we talked about what we wanted OMS to be, mm-hmm. what we wanted the partnership to be, which was we wanted to get out of you guys' way, we wanted to be more of an enabler, mm. be more of a partner, and ever since then, I mean, honestly, uh, things have opened up, kicked off, um, and they've been great, great, great partners. So. Yeah, I mean, so to that end a little bit, when I came, so I'm the, the wily veteran between the two of us, <laughs> yeah, I started right? in, in June. And uh, when I came, it was somewhat obvious that we didn't have a great relationship with OMES either. And so there are lots of areas in which we have bad relationships or had, you know, relationships that could be improved. Mm -hmm. And um, I always took the sort of the blame for that a little bit, like, hey, let's make sure we are going over the top to, to build these deep relationships. And so, I mean, from the moment you walked in it was obvious that we had uh, a partner going forward. Yeah, and not awesome. that we didn't before. I didn't have the institutional experience. So I'm not sure. saying we'd, we didn't have a partner going forward. I just know that we had relationship building to do in lots of places. And uh, it has been uh, nothing short of uh, the beginnings of transformation, I think, for that, state government. That is awesome. So yeah. that that's a perfect kind of segue into what this podcast is, what what the reason is behind it. Steve, your vision for this whole thing was was really to set something up uh, that is a reflection of what OMES is, which is we just want to be a service. We want to be uh, here to promote and 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 uh, help uh, others accomplish their vision. So what we want to learn more about today was really just on, honestly about you, Justin, mm-hmm. and what DHS has going on. Uh, maybe get into some of the more recent things like how COVID has uh, affected you guys, your day-to-day processes, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess let's just start at the beginning. What, give us a little background on, on you. Sure. Uh, your new to the uh, public uh, sector. What what is your background before you got into working for state government? Yeah, so I'll try to keep it brief. Is it is it diverse? Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> I've heard it's diverse. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in the past. Um, so ultimately, I'm from Oklahoma City uh, originally. So uh, my father moved to Southern California when I was two. So I was in LA and San Diego some uh, through the first uh, probably 15 years of my life, and he wow. moved back to Oklahoma after that. And um, so grew up in Oklahoma City, like I said, just um, sort of living the dream as an Okie in the 80s and, and, uh, and 90s, of course, and um, got into uh, school at uh, Oklahoma State. And so uh, my wife, actually, my wife and I started dating in high, dating in high school at Bishop McGinnis. And then... Uh, and what's your wife's name? Her name is Kelly. Kelly. Yeah, okay, so gotcha. we've been together now. Gosh, should it, this should roll right off the... Oh, I can't on, wait to show this to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been together... We got, uh, we got, 19, the, editing, we got the editing we, crew ready. Here yeah, <laughs> please do. Now, we've been together 24 years almost. That's um, incredible. I'm married uh, not quite that long, but uh, I think nine, about 19 years, coming up on 19 years married. So walk us through, like, how did you get... Uh, how did I get what, into state yeah, government? Yeah, what, what was your yeah. process of... Uh, what What were you doing professionally? And yeah. how did that how did that whole thing work out? It's actually a pretty interesting story. So um, I, after college, I was a finance guy in college, mm-hmm. and so I started in the commercial healthcare world, so financing large hospitals debt. So I did Integris, Deaconess, Mercy, you know, big hospital systems in healthcare. So then I got into healthcare banking, and so then from there I started a senior housing company. So we owned and operated assisted living and memory care communities in three states, Oklahoma, Colorado, and Texas. Really? Okay. Yep. Cool. And so That's awesome. I did that for 11 years, CEO of that company. And then what, what was um, the company called? Uh, it's called uh, Choice Capital Partners, okay. but our, we operated under a few different names. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, the most uh, recent one was Villaggio Senior Living. Okay. So oh, go ahead. And so um, really what, uh, so on April 1st of 2019, 
uh, we signed an agreement to outsource the management of that business to a company out of Denver, just a, a trend in the industry. And, um, but I didn't know what that meant for me personally, right? So that was 99% of my day was running the senior housing business. And uh, on April the 16th of that uh, year, 15 days later, I got a call from uh, the head of transition for the governor's team and said, hey, the governor wants to know if you are interested in serving the state. And I said, um, thanks, but I'm good. Appreciate that. Because uh, I had no, I mean, I had no background in state government. Wow. And uh, so he said, well, if you're 1% interested, we should talk again. And so I said, okay, I'm 1% I'm interested. What does that mean? And so we talked for about 10 days. And I, I finally met the governor. I'd never met uh, Governor Stitt mm -hmm. until 10 days after that first phone call. And in fact, um, don't tell him this. Um, I know it's a, just a casual conversation. Yeah, right. Yeah. But he actually called me during the campaign and asked for a donation. And I said, no, because I was supporting his opponent. So really? we had no connection, zero. I think I've mended that uh, <laughs> since, Hopefully, yeah, yes. that relationship <laughs> since. But um, honestly, it's just an illustration of the fact that there, wow. you know, we were he just looking for the right people right. and didn't have any uh, didn't have any sort of desire for you know what their background was or connection with him personally. So we met. Uh, I talked to a bunch of people, and then exactly thirty days from the phone call uh -huh. uh, was my first day as the uh, director of DHS. Holy cow! Super so that cool. all happened like no, I'm sorry, sixty days. I don't sixty know if days. 30, sixty days. Still, I mean, that's yeah. kind of a from from running the business to sixty days later, you're yeah. running DHS. Absolutely. That's I mean, gotta, I was, it's got to be like you didn't see that coming at all. Not at all. I was all in in my business before, but when it stopped, it was like my whole day. So I had nothing. I mean, like I was just waiting right. for the next thing for me. And I didn't know what that was. It was just sort of a leap of faith. And then I got the phone call. So how did your background help you at DHS? Because during COVID, yeah. the elderly had been hit really hard. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. There was, there was times when we were all over at the Joint Operations Command Center where we're trying to figure out housing, housing options. Yeah. I think you may have been part of the team I was. That was talking to I the was. universities. Mm -hmm. So talk, talk to us a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, so uh, my background, of course, in senior housing helps with two of the, we have seven program divisions within DHS. Two of them are around seniors, so adult protective services and aging services. So, of course, that's a deep connection for me. Right. And that helped a lot in the COVID situation. But further, for 20 years before this response, this role, I served lots of nonprofits around kids. So um, everything from YMCA's to Boys and Girls Clubs to Big Brothers and Big Sisters, Children's Hospital Foundation, mm -hmm. board membership, deep service. So uh, I had a really deep experience in in serving nonprofits that serve kids. So all of that connects with my. Wow. You know, when you took your job, out. I'm just curious because when you talk to different directors to see what their approach was. So when you walked in day one, you had to identify the problem set. How did you build a team? Oh, man, that's a great question. So I worked uh, candidly in that 60-day period mm -hmm. within – so the call was on the 16th of April. Um, within a day, I had sort of already resigned myself. fact that I'm going for this. Like, if you get this opportunity – that's really what I told the governor. I said, like, hey, if if you say no to me, I'm good. The mm -hmm. world is the world is good for me. Um, but if you say yes to me and I say no to you, I'll think about it every day for the rest of my life. And I don't have anything like that, so I'm all in. Mm -hmm. And so he said, you're the guy. A few days later, called me and said, you're the guy. Um, but how did I build a team was a great question. So I worked with the former cabinet secretary, Steve Buck, uh, for that full 60 day period, uh, to work on the team, on the vision, you know, what, what my vision was for the agency. He was a really good sounding board. Um, and I still consider him to be an ally and a partner. Wow. So we worked together. He introduced me to my chief of staff at the time. I mean, one of the first introductions that he made for me was Samantha Galloway, who's been a, a tremendous ally um, in in all of the work that we're doing. And from there, we just keep going and building and adding and, and putting people in the right places. That's right. really a key. And one of the things that, that was so in, uh, fascinating to me is we have this unbelievable workforce. Like you walk in DHS, in every county office, those people are fully committed to what they do, passionate and so qualified. But there's some people that are in the wrong seats, right? You For just sure. have to have to make sure that you, mm. you have the vision and that you put people in the right spots. And Boy, when we started doing that, it was just like a gold mine. So it's interesting because when I took the job at OMES, which that was never the plan. You know, I worked yeah. for the governor's bank. It was you go do the governor thing, we're going to hang back. <clears throat> but when, when I'm a Rubik's Cube guy, so when he started presenting some of these problems, when we showed up on scene at ISD first, it was, okay, we had to evaluate the team, evaluate the problems. Who do we want to bring into this? And a lot of it we did find that ISD at the time had a really bad reputation, but we actually had talent. We actually had people that had some vision. Our new CIO, Jerry Moore, is one of them. Yeah, I mean, fantastic. Fantastic resource. So, uh, and there's others. Um, and then when we, when I was, uh, when I got the directorship uh, in January for OMES, same thing. And so we started kind of building based on recommendations, based on, you know, some, 
some new blood versus, you know, some of the folks like a Dana Webb, my chief of staff, who's been around for a while. Mm-hmm. Kathy Mendarvis, who probably one of the best attorneys in the state. Um, and then, you know, we, we have Leah uh, Tepper McHughes mm-hmm. as our CFO. And I'm going to name, I'm going to forget to name people and someone gets shot later. <laughs> But you know, like your Emmy, your Emmy acceptance speech, right? But it's cr- yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's crazy because I mean, like you've got a massive organization that yeah. provides services to over a million Oklahomans. Yep. We serve 189 agencies and affiliates that serve ish, you know, three million people. Yeah. I don't know. Um, oh, yeah. And it's just really cool from our perspective now to see, like, what you guys have been doing. So talk a little bit about, um, like. Front port, not front porch, I'm sorry. Um, be a neighbor. Yeah, yeah. Talk sure. a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about some of the initiatives you've got going, some of the relationships you guys Man have been we can, I can go for a long time, so you're going to have to put an end to this at some <laughs> point. But I, I will talk about be a neighbor. Um, I'll also, at some point, we can talk about there's the vision for the overall agency, yeah. which, love that. which yeah. things will plug into that conversation. Right. We built a framework around the vision that allows us to plug new efforts in as we move forward. Mm-hmm. But you mentioned be a neighbor, which is a really great uh, concept. So it was really born from the governor. Like he, he was out on the campaign trail. And, and then now as governor, seeing that there are so many people around in the, our communities that want to serve, um, but there's just no way to connect people, right? Like, um, and here's a perfect illustration. Um, one of my favorite things to do is walk around our county offices within our agency and just talk to people like, hey, you know, what do you need? How's it going? That sort of thing. And so at one point I, I talked to somebody, I said, so what do you do with a customer of yours who needs um, a mental health resource or needs a workforce development program? And she leaned over, and I was, in, I was in Chandler, Oklahoma. She leans over and pulls this, like, Post-it note off the wall, and it had four or five names and phone numbers written on it. And I thought, man, alive, we're managing the needs of more than a million at-risk people, most, some of the most vulnerable people in our communities. We're doing it from Post-it notes. Mm-hmm. And so that really aligned with what the governor's idea was around Be a Neighbor, which is connecting resources in communities. So this platform connects community resources – Uh, Those are called neighbors. Those are organizations that want to serve with what we call seekers. Those are individuals who are looking for some level of service, whether it be a food pantry or, you know, um, like I said, a workforce development program or whatever. And the magic is the underlying platform. It's a Salesforce platform. And so it's um, it has an advocate platform. So casework actually happens within the tool. So we have. We have about 180 kids a year who age out of foster care. Mm -hmm. Well, our permanency planning team utilizes this tool to connect resources with their kids. So we know that here's the exact housing resource this kid has when they age out of foster care, if it happens. Of course, our goal is for nobody to ever age out of foster sure. care. That's what we're working on. But at the same time, we have to case manage. So, so, so that's this being is there. a great platform almost that, that's been established to kind of help. It's almost like technology, helping technology talk to each other. It's helping the system be able to better communicate so that taking no care doubt. of these kids and stuff like that just is made more efficient, take care of them better. Absolutely. So there are three ages. So this is another, uh, this is an untold story that I think you all can do, a, that use this platform to tell is the way that agencies are working together like they never have. Our agencies is a good example of that, but they're, it's happening everywhere. So uh, the edu- part of, uh, Department of Education, uh-huh. Healthcare Authority, State Health Department, all of these organizations are talking like they never have. So this Be a Neighbor is a good example that the advocate platform isn't just for DHS. Wow. It's for DOC, and it's also for OJA and for Department of Education because That's they cool. case manage for kids too That's and people cool. who are transitioning from one stage of life, whether it be in foster care or in the criminal justice system or whatever, to a new uh, a new new stage of life. So, so talk right. about your mission at DHS. Yeah. Talk about the vision and the mission that okay. you guys are underway with. Absolutely. So um, I, I went through a, a really uh, pretty robust strategy um, that for 60 days before I started. I wanted to become a space of innovation. And for me, in the context of DHS, innovation means we are a self-correcting organization. You know, we deal with lots of people, lots of human uh, flaws and issues, but, but when there is something that occurs that's bad, we correct ourselves. We don't need the outside world to come in and regulate us and tell us how to run it. We're good at it ourselves. So I built a little equation, and I'm going to go sort of deep into it. I'll, okay, sure. I'll, uh, but the, the first element is this customer-centered culture. And that's what you're building here. Mm-hmm. We have different customers, but it's the same culture, right? Same it's, thing, right? It's, it's a right. level of service and making sure we build our organization around the people that we serve, that, that our customer doesn't have to plug into us. We wrap around them. So right. that's the first element, customer-centered right. culture. Second is something called finding our true north. And um, I'll talk a little more about that here in a second. But it really is 
understanding the direction that we're heading as an organization. So each of our divisions put this together. They're their own true north. It's three to five guiding principles or philosophies that they are pursuing to serve their customer. Um, the third is really working on deep uh, systems and processes. Mm -hmm. And so we, we know who we're going to serve and we're, we're built around them. Um, we um, we've have this true north, so we know how we serve. And now the systems and processes that we, that we pursue are driving value for our customer every time we engage. And then the fourth, which is critically important, is building a set of deep collaborative relationships. We, we serve a million and a quarter people in the state of Oklahoma, just about almost a third of the state's population with 6,200 employees. The math doesn't work. We have to do it together. We have to engage our partners in the community to serve alongside one another. So all of those things, to me, create a system that is one that self-regulates uh, and it self-corrects when there's an issue. So to part of that, as you started creating that, um, let's talk culture just for a second yeah. within DHS. When you came into DHS, what, what did that look like? Mm. Uh, what did, what is your vision for as far as creating a, a better culture within DHS? Is that part of the equation, or kind of speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so culture is is huge, right? So if um, if you can, if I could do one thing within any organization that I'm involved with is create this culture that is a service first culture. Okay. So um, I I'm, I did not have experience in the agency before, so mm -hmm. I can't I can't really give too much depth on what it was like before because I just wasn't here. Right. Um, but the approach I'm trying to take moving forward is is really driving systems and building systems with the end user at the end of, or in mind as you're creating them. Gotcha. So a really great example is a new system that we built in child welfare. And in fact, um, our director of child welfare, who's new as well, is, is a hero of mine. If you haven't talked to Deb Shropshire, she will, you will follow her into the fire anywhere you go. It's great. You gotta meet her. Yeah, know, you right? you yeah. need to, you right. will love her. Anyway, so she built a system and her team called Enhanced Foster Care. And this system, instead of moving kids out of foster care, a traditional home, into a higher a home called intensive uh, foster care or, or therapeutic foster care, um, which is a disruption for that child. It's a traumatic experience. We're wrapping services around the child in their home mm -hmm. now so that it helps for long-term placement stability. It helps remove trauma from kids and gives families wow. the, the, the things they need to be successful. It's a perfect example. The system we had before required that child to move into a different service level to get the service they need. Mm -hmm. So that's we are requiring, requiring them to plug into our system. Now we've built a system that wraps around the child and the family and serves them in their own space. So that's the culture we're trying to build. That's um, awesome. So with, so that with your employees, it's interesting too. So um, I think what we see similarly, similarly in this space, which is you want more empowerment. You want more of the employees bringing uh, experiences and needs so they can, you can work together to solve things. Talk to us a little bit about the Council of Voices and what that oh, yeah. is yeah. and uh, what you, how you're using Ooh, that. It's going to be great. So um, this is a part of, uh, so everything plugs into the framework of True North for us. So we have eight executive leadership True North elements. And number seven is building a uh, culture of equity, diversity, and inclusion. It is an opportunity for us because we serve a million and a quarter vulnerable Oklahomans, with 60, the largest workforce in, the, in state government, to really change the conversation around systemic bias and implicit racism. I mean, that's, that's a mission of all of us. Right. So we built what's called the Council of Voices, one element that plugs into the executive leadership, True North number seven. And the Council of Voices is today 20 people, uh, probably scaling to 30. And this group gets together on a monthly basis and I have the opportunity, or a, a division director, if they, if they want to utilize that, have the opportunity to present a program that we are working on to the council. And these 20 people represent all underserved or underrepresented communities in our state. So, of course, every racial and ethnic back, uh, background and makeup that you can imagine, LGBT community, um, every faith we're working on, uh, Muslim faith, Jewish faith, of course, Christian faith. Um, we're working on uh, people who are actually experiencing homelessness, somebody who is food insecure. These are programs that are developed to serve the, the community, but so many times these communities don't have a voice in their creation. Wow. And so that's what we're building is in the Council of Voices is 20 to 30 people that we can bring these programs to and, and just humbly say, this is what we're thinking and doing. How, how are we not listening to you? You know, the voice of the senior or the voice right. of the youth. Right. Right? How are we not listening to you? And then again, it also it's a two-way conversation. So there's also this venue for the community to come to us and say, listen, I hear DHS does this, or in my community, here's what's happened. 
and allows us to have that level of accountability. That's really the the direction we're heading is mm-hmm. transparency and accountability because we all at our core, our foundations want the same thing. You know, we want kids in need to be right. served. We want families who are struggling um, to be resilient and to to be um, self-sufficient. We all want those things. So it's all about communication and designing systems to serve together. So how's this changed, modified? How's your wife, your kids? How do they, I mean, they see dad now. He's yeah. out leading a massive effort for an amazing agency that's doing incredible work. You've got plus 6,000 people that mm-hmm. are a small army that are taking on a massive challenge. Your phone's got to ring all the time. I see, I mean, if you guys don't know this, he's social media, just watch him. He's, when he's not at work, he's at an event somewhere. Yeah. How, what's the, uh, how's your family handling that? What's their experience with the so life we're, of Justin Brown? The, <laughs> so um, we're fortunate in that um, I made the decision early on to engage them in the conversation. So well before I started, uh, our 12-year-old daughter and 11-year-old son, 10 at the time, um, I talked to them about it. You know, I, I'll never forget a conversation where I, I picked up my daughter at dance. We went to Chili's for dinner. We're sitting across just the two of us, and I was talking about this. You know, hey, here's who we serve. Here's what we do. Um, what are your thoughts? And it was probably the greatest conversation I've ever had with a human being in my life was this conversation with my 12-year-old daughter mm-hmm. because she she um, really put herself in the shoes of the people that, that I'm trying to serve in this way and had so much um, – she just connected with the Very mission. Cool. And so now I'm able to talk with them about, um, of course, not confidential things, but I can share the mission that we're taking. And they're, they feel like they're in it. It's not dad doing this. It's all of us doing this together. Yeah, and so uh, my wife's always been service minded as well. And so it's she it fits right in with her sort of a philosophy on life as well. Doing, you know, more personal, you don't have to share if you don't want yeah. to, but do, do your children have any aspirations of you know, following in dad's footsteps or... Um, um, is wow. it too early to tell? That's a good question. Um, I know both of them are committed to serving their communities. Mm-hmm. They, I mean, they they just love it when we go. Uh, serve, we we pack backpacks at the food bank for schools. Uh, we've served meals for Christmas, those sorts of things, and um, so they've they've loved that stuff. I think it's probably too early to tell. Sure. you know what the future is for them, but um, I, candidly, it makes it so much easier in anything that you do when you bring your family right. along. Yeah, yeah, that is awesome. So during this last legislative session, okay. Was there anything that frustrated you during that process? I mean, as I understand, that was your first time going through it. It was, yeah. Mine as well. So um, there was a lot of great partners that we have with the legislature, right? Um, But it is still a new process that guys like you and me are having to learn. Um, Is there anything that you walked away from it that going into the next session you want to change or you do differently? I mean, what kind of lessons did you take away from that? Yeah, sure. So uh, not only was it my first session in this position, but it was the first time I've been in the Capitol since 1993 when I was a House page. Right, so really? literally, oh, we didn't I know was. That. I didn't yes, know that. Oh, tell me, God, please, there's pictures of that somewhere. Who, who I'll find it. Okay. I do. Uh, Robert Worthen. Really? Yes. So uh, cool. that was the last time I was actually in the Capitol. Right. So I have I had no experience. Um, I think it's changed maybe a little bit. Since a little then? bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're working on it anyway. But um, so the, I think the the really the part of it to me that's a little bit frustrating is you do your best to be communicative, yeah. to really talk and share and discuss. And there are just so many voices, not necessarily legislative voices, but outside voices um, that um, that and maybe this is a function of the relationship building that we have to do as an agency. So I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but that go to the legislature first, Mm -hmm. like we can solve problems. Right. And and the culture hasn't been where we've been receptive for outsiders to come to our agency with problems. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's what maybe that's our fault. But I, I really want to, to be more proactive with our community partners um, and, and, and have this safe space for them to say, you know, listen, there's a, there's a problem here and w- let's try to fix it rather than running legislation to try to fix it. Right. Right. And so um, I don't know. I, it, that's probably the biggest frustration. I will tell you, though, I, I, I feel like we are blessed with really wonderful relationships across the lawn. Um, I mean, we can we can pick up the phone and call and talk yep. and have a legitimate, reasonable right. conversation. I, we have a lot of members who are free to do the same with us, to mm-hmm. raise concerns. And uh, I think we're starting to get the benefit of the doubt mm-hmm. um, that, you know, when the phone call comes, it's not accusatory. Sure. It is really just trying to be collaborative. And I love that. So here's <laughs> here's something that we're still dealing with at OMS. I'm just curious. Mm-hmm. When you came in... Um, would you consider, would, would it be fair to say that DH's brand with the legislature when you came in 
was positive, negative? Sure. I um, mean, yeah. How would, and when you answer that, I've got to follow up real quick. Okay. Um, I, I think um, we had work to do at the legislature. Um, and I think it was probably good that I walked in from the outside because I didn't carry any baggage. sort of baggage or sure. institutional connection with the organization, right? I was coming in as um, really a, a bridge builder. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so I, didn't, I didn't have to overcome personal issues, you know, that, that uh, had arisen in prior years. So we had work to do across the lawn. And we've, we've spent a lot of time doing it because we needed to. It's, I mean, they are so important to what we do as an organization. They totally are. Yeah. I, I bring it because OMS obviously had some challenges in that space for sure. And, and, and go, coming into it, there wasn't there a lot of people that you could bounce ideas off of in, in advance. And, but we started reaching out to, you know, like Senator Thompson, for mm -hmm. example. Absolutely. Um, def, definitely uh, Representative Wallace and, and a few others to start building kind of a, not a coalition. It, it became that eventually, mm -hmm. but it started out as, Tell us what you need. I mean, if mm -hmm. we're going to serve, let's serve everybody. And it, the partnerships developed over time. The attorney general, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Mike Hunter, is another one that we purposely sought out because we want to make sure that um, he's a statewide elected official as well. Um, Superintendent Hoffmeister is another one. I know you've worked with her quite Very a bit. Very closely, yeah. Yeah, so it's just been interesting to kind of get this, this in, in terms of changing the brand, right? First, it starts with action, right? It starts with actually doing things and serving people. But ha but would you say that's been received well? I mean, where mm -hmm. you are now, coming out of this legislative session, you seem like, seem like you guys had a very successful session. Um, uh, do you feel like uh, DHS is now being well received? I, we're certainly on the road to that. That's um, awesome. And it's and the, I think the evidence is that we just get collaborative phone calls, right? Like, yeah. uh, not to say that there aren't mm -hmm. concerns and issues. We deal with humanity. I mean, and it's in all of its flaws. We deal with humanity, so there are issues. But at the same time. We get lots of just brainstorming conversations like, hey, you know, what's the mission for next session? How do you want to handle this? Do you have some vision, some changes that we want to make? And we're doing starting that now so we can wow. really start to be proactive around what next session looks like. I mean, we have we have re both of our organizations have real opportunity. Right to really change the state. Absolutely. And so that means we have to be active with all of our partners and it has to be a give and take. Our mission statement is OMS serves those who serve Oklahomans. We want to be in the background. I mean, we really do. Right. Um, but at the same time, we, as, as good partners, it's kind of like this, this fine line that we ride. We're like, this whole session is we want the world to hear more about what you're doing and what your agency's doing. We want to talk a little bit about the partnership uh, but at the same time, uh, we want to celebrate success. And you guys are like on the brink of doing some really cool things that the state's never done. Mm -hmm. you, any of those you want to touch on or that you think oh, would be? Oh, wow. Um, you mentioned the bot technology yeah. earlier. I think that's something that people can get their arms around. Um, so, yeah, let's let's talk about that for a minute. So, um, I, as far as we know, we're the first agency that has really explored that's um, accurate. Uh, bot, bot technology. And um, really, the opportunity is to streamline processes for the benefit of our customers. And so uh, we did a, a, a payroll or a timesheet in improvement process through utilizing uh, automated technology. And um, it's been extremely successful. And we've got other ideas on how to do that because we want to take our workforce and trade up their time, right? Mm -hmm. the, the people that were working on some of this work are, like, overqualified to, to – go from one screen to the next screen and just type the same information in, right? We needed to find a way to automate that. And now we're able to elevate them to, to positions where they're serving our customers rather than typing in a computer, right? So that's that's one of those. Which sure. is super cool because I don't think people outside of this conversation understand that in state government. Um, there just hasn't been a big appetite for people to come in and look at true business process optimization through technology. But it started with identifying the, the way you wanted to work and then you started throwing tech and, and bot mm -hmm. at it. And uh, early uh, in our relationship, when I was yeah. over there, I, I can't remember the individual's name. Tara. Tara, that's right. Yes. And she was awesome. She's ours. And she, <laughs> 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 and she lit up like a Christmas tree yeah. when you got... Wow. And it was truly groundbreaking, at least for the state. So She came to... And what was great, it was a little bit of an illustration of the culture we're trying to build. Is she came to us and said, hey, I have this idea... Can we think about it? And we said, absolutely. Let's try one. Pick one where it wouldn't, you know, impact our customers if it didn't work. Like right. if it's not a, it wouldn't disrupt our, our daily business. But go try it. Like, and so um, about a month later, I was walking back from the the history center, and Tara meets me in the lobby and says, "Hey, come take a picture." 
And I had no idea what you, and I was like, okay, let's take a picture. So I went up to the fourth floor in finance and there are everybody standing there in front of the finance, DHS finance sign. And we're celebrating the bot because they had, they had just finished it. And like everybody was super excited because uh, it's just this like sweeping culture change of innovation. And it came from our team. It wow. didn't come from me right, right. or some vendor somewhere. It came from our team. And so we've got to build organizations that mine all oh, of absolutely. that intellectual property and passion. So Well, as a data point, I believe DHS won the Innovation Award we from did. the governor absolutely. this last leadership Hey, session. Yeah, so, in, your, in your face, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all right. We're making up with the podcast. Okay. <laughs> oh, we got to, we're in the running for this no. next year. Okay. So we're trying. Right. All right. We're, we're trying. Hey, no, I, but that, that was awesome. I got a question that's kind of a changing gear, but yeah. sort of along that so, same topic. So COVID, mm -hmm. COVID-19, everybody's talking about, everybody knows it's affected everybody, you know, in one way or another. It's affected OMES, and a lot of our employees have gone to a remote working type 98%. schedule. 98 percent Yeah. Wow, nice. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit to how COVID has affected you? your day-to-day -day operations, yeah. and how is that affecting the end user? Uh, what are you doing to combat that to make sure that people are taken care of? Yeah, so this this could be a long conversation, but I'll, I'll do what I can. Remember you, said I have, you said I have three hours. Yeah, <laughs> in, in the invite, Steve said, I think, 20 minutes to like three hour hours. Hour, yeah, hour, something yeah. like Whatever that. You, yeah. Yeah, okay. It just so, goes. So COVID, of course, has taken over our worlds and our lives, and none of us ever expected that we would be um, we would be needed to be a part of this, a solution to anything like this. So um, I, I talk about it a number of times. Here, here's what we learned from COVID with regard to our workforce. So on, I believe it was March the 20th, we closed our all of our offices to uh, walk in traffic. It was by appointment only. And that was a really big strategy for us. That was um, ahead of the curve a little bit. It was ahead of the curve, okay. March the 20th. Three, day, three days in front of us. And I think you guys went... Okay, Samantha tells it. That's when you closed your doors. Yes. I think you started sending staff oh, home on, yes. the, on like the 12th. We did. Absolutely. We said, hey, um, go home. We'll, you know, If you got a laptop and, and can telework, do it. Otherwise, we're going to get you the technology to make it work. But we, like, one of the things that keeps me up at night is the idea that we could be the catalyst for spread of COVID-19. Hmm. And we have 92 buildings in the state of Oklahoma with 6,200 employees it's very real mm -hmm. that somebody, people walk into our buildings all the time, right? And so we had to be uh, a little out front of that. And so we closed March 20th to walk in traffic. Now I will tell you, you can get an appointment on the front porch, right? And somebody will let you in, but it allows us first to try to solve your needs remotely first to, through our call centers or internet, or, or internet uh, uh, presence, which is very robust. It works well. Mm -hmm. We can serve 99% of our customers' needs remotely. And so it's um, amazing. It is pretty incredible. It's awesome. Uh, but um, so so we we did that. Um, but you can get an appointment online, or not even online. Just come up to the front porch, call. They'll screen you. Make sure you haven't been to you know those familiar questions about right. going to Italy and right. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we'll let somebody will come and let you in. So but we went from like three thousand visits a day to forty in ninety two offices. That's incredible. So we had fifty offices a day that had nobody come in. Right. So here's what we learned from that in in three months ish of doing that. We learned three things. One is that we're really good at serving remotely. I just shared we can solve you know 99 percent of our customers needs online or through the call center. The second one is our workforce is at least as productive working from home as they are working from the office. So here's how we know that. One is we did a telework survey and it indicated that 86.7 percent of our workforce said we are at least as, as productive or more productive working at home. And we validated that with actual data, data. Wow. like processing okay. data, those sorts of things. Yeah. So, so we, that's, that's a true statement. And then the third thing we learned was um, our workforce wants to work from home. There are 93.3% 90, of 4,000 respondents said that they want to work at least part-time or full-time uh, remotely after the COVID situation. So uh, those are the three things we learned. And it was, and that insight we would never have gotten if it weren't It's almost for like this. a forced deal. It really was. Wow, okay. And so, and keep in mind, all of that happened while we're trying to put technology into people's hands, equip them with cell phones. Like there was major disruption. And I think we did a great job of it with the help from OMES, mm -hmm. but it wasn't smooth, right? Like we got to recognize it's really ch tough to yeah. move 6,000 people yeah. to telework. And so um, all of that said, we were successful in it. So we, we, um, we re learned those three things. 
Um, secondly, since the very beginning, I talked about our executive leadership, True North, and the first one we talked about was around equity. The second executive leadership, True North, is all around removing systematic barriers that keep our customers from being successful. So we hear, uh, hear about this all the time. That means um, transportation barriers, like I'm forced to go to a DHS office and then to a healthcare department office right. and then to a, you know, whatever. And so I can't get there. I don't have transportation or childcare barriers. Like I have to take all, you know, half day to get off work right. and employment barriers. Like I'm a part-time employee and like if I take off, I won't have a job anymore. So these are barriers that exist. So we've intended forever to remove those barriers since the very beginning so that we can we can really become part of our community. And And initially that was around embedded worker programs. So embedded in schools, embedded in uh, hospitals, anywhere that our customer is, we want to be there. So you don't have to come to us. We'll right. be there for you. That's cool. So we've, we've been building that in pretty deep ways. And I can talk a lot about that. But it's co-locating opportunities with other agencies. Uh, so we've been really working on this over time. So uh, I'm going to combine the things that we learned, those three things, right. um, with the, the passion and the mission to get out and remove barriers and be a part of our community along with, candidly, what was a pretty legitimate budget shortfall that we had in our right. agency, right? So we, we were $28 million shortfalls, uh, just under 4%. And um, we decided from the very beginning of this budget conversation that we were going to preserve um, the um, services that we provide to our customers as number one. That's, that's why we're here. Right. Secondly, we were going to prioritize our workforce. They are so critical in delivering those services. So if we prioritize those above all else, that means it deprioritizes other things. So we did all that. We looked at all those things. Here's what we learned, this, this systematic barrier busting concept and this budget shortfall. And we said, listen, we're going to close some of our real estate footprint. So that's the direction we headed as a, as a budget savings. Mm -hmm. So we saved a pretty good chunk of money. Um, and the, the concept is what we call service first. So pri not only prioritizing those services, but getting deeper into our communities. Right. So instead of being tethered to an office or a desk or a cubicle, you are now in your community. Right. So I use this example all the time, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it. No, you're great. But here's the oh, example. Great. The example is if I live in Cleo Springs, Oklahoma, right now, and I'm a DHS employee, I drive to my building in Fairview, Oklahoma. You know, it's 20-ish minutes away, 20, 30 minutes away. Um, and then, but if I have a customer that lives in Cleo Springs, Oklahoma, that customer also drives to Fairview, to the DHS office. That's how it works today. So why do I need to drive all the way? Both of us drive into Fairview, take off, they have to take off work, find childcare, all right. those things that we just talked about. Why can't I just meet them in my community? And so we're building deep, what we call service first partnerships across the state. So that's other agencies that we've talked about, state health department, uh, the library system is a really wonderful tool for us. And Melody Kellogg, the Department of Libraries, has become a, a good ally in this front. That's awesome. Um, but it's, it's, it's private enterprise as well. Um, it is partners in our community, it's a church network, mm -hmm. so that we have spaces to go in more communities. I actually believe at the end of this, instead of 92 locations, we will have hundreds spread out all across the state, physical touch points for our employees to meet their customers in their community and still maintain that savings as absolutely well, right? that's the key yeah wow. absolutely so it was a really good approach um and it, it honestly it can't, we came up with it because of this desire to be collaborative with our teams around the budget process um, i think historically agencies really just take a top-down approach to budget like big dollars super complicated just go find it mm -hmm. but we brought our teams together and, said, and we spent two months working on this, well before we even knew what the number was. We were preparing for 15, 20%. And we just said, hey, um, let's figure it all out together. What's our mission as a team? Right. Everybody's budgets as divisions, sure. let's figure it out. And so so, that so what do you top. see as like the biggest challenges? Now, now that you, you guys have outlined an amazing strategy, you've got 6,000 people, you've got a great real estate plan. What's the threat? Like what's the threat to DHS? If you looked at it like from a, like a SWOT analysis, you had yeah. to consider what or what's on the horizon that is a big problem, big social issue, something that the agency is going to have to deal with that you're still getting your mind around or mm. something that you know is coming. Mm. Is there anything like that that's sitting out there? Yeah, so we, of course, deal with, uh, I mentioned it earlier, humanity, right? Yeah. So there, those threats always exist. You know, our, our intent is to never know a family in this state. But it, unfortunately, at times we, we are called when there are concerns. Right. Um, and so there are always those sorts of threats, right? The, the things that, um, that we see on a daily basis are things that nobody would ever want to see. So those sorts of threats exist. Um, but we have 
Um, I, I, I really can't think of a lot of just like, I mean, of course, budget. Like COVID, we talked about COVID. The, the upcoming year, I tell my team all the time, we have no idea what's coming, hmm. right? Like, and you all need to be prepared. We right. don't know. I need you right. thinking about efficiencies right now. And I need you to think about more than efficiencies, but but divisional and agency transformation opportunities. You know, because we're, it's it's so difficult to act in a an emergency response scenario when it comes to budget. We have to be proactive. So this is July 1 that we're recording this, the first day of this fiscal year. We're already working on agency transformation stuff for next budget year because we think it could be tough. It's tough because we look – I always talk in terms of know your normal. Yeah. Know your normal on your finances, on your opera, operational um, efficiencies, on your customer. What does normal look like? Well, now we're redefining that. Our workforce is transient. Um, we've got a customer that also is transient for the most part um, for, you know, providing central services to DHS and other agencies in the state. It's, it's, uh, hasn't become problematic, but it's become a challenge because of remote and making sure people are responsive, making sure we're not dropping the ball on things. Um, in terms of your new normal, what's that look like? Yeah, so our new normal is um, completely different than our old normal. And that normal is um, this service first thing where we are much deeper in our communities is or can be uncomfortable for some people, right? We are, um, our intent is to embed ourselves, truly become a part of the fabric of our communities. And when you do that, you're stepping out of your, you know, sort of your comfy cubicle, right? You're stepping out into the world. So it's, it's um, put, our new normal is um, really putting ourselves at a little bit of emotional risk and saying that the right way to do things is, um, is doing so in a, in a servant mindset. And that means we're coming to you and we're going to figure it out and we're not going to stop until we figure it out, whatever that looks like. So the coming to you aspect, um, speak real quick to, to your employees, to those employees mm-hmm. who are actually out in the field. Uh, one, is the workforce that you have out there right now, or, or do you envision that expanding to, mm-hmm. to reach, in, in, like you said, embed into the community more? I speak to those in-game yeah. employees who are actually in the field dealing with these situations. they just they got to be amazing people they just, are. just dealing I with this. I will tell you, and th- I'll keep this one short, but I early on, I, got, I had an experience with Child Protective Services. I, I went out on a ride along. I said, hey, take me with you. So I was with, with um, a, a worker here in Oklahoma County um, who is a hero of mine now. I mean, this girl, like, I don't know, 25 years old, young girl, um, super sharp. We, I mean, we walked up to this door where she'd never been in this house before, and she just walked right in. And, I mean, she was there to protect the kids, and it was awesome. And uh, I'm telling you, they are. it's an incredible workforce. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's one where I think we, ha- we do have sufficient resources to, and with the workforce that we have, to mm-hmm. serve our communities in these deep ways. We just have to get set outside of the box and think differently about right. how we serve. Right, how you uh, utilize that. Absolutely. Right. Okay, gotcha. And so, so we're taking, you know, there may be a, an office of 100 people. Well, now, that because we don't have that building anymore, they're in the community, right? So they're just deployed differently. Another, like a really big thing, I think, in the future, which is a sort of a cosmic shift in human in human services, is utilizing other social workers. So I believe that the resources that we have at the Department of Human Services in the state of Oklahoma need to be um, promoted by private enterprise uh, social workers. So you, I hear about, about it all the time. Hospitals have social workers. Uh, there are, there are uh, nonprofits all over the state that have people who work with our customers. Mm-hmm. So why don't we empower them with the tools sure. to serve our customers so that we can spread even deeper and become truly a part of that fabric? So what do you do? Are you doing anything on a national level? So are you mm-hmm. working with other states? I mean, it sounds like you guys have a lot of uh, really cool initiatives that are rolling. And before we get done talking, we got to talk about Emergency Snap because Samantha oh, Galloway yeah. absolutely wanted to you know make sure we got sure, that. Sure, absolutely. No, but in terms of like other states, um, as busy as you guys are in the mission you have, um, the governor has this vision for us to be a top 10. How is DHS making that a reality or how are you partnering with other states? Great question. So um, not only I, historically has our agency been siloed between divisions and we've already talked about it, agencies have been siloed amongst each other. But I believe also, in my space at least, um, states have been siloed on their own as well. So um, I have calls very regularly with my counterparts in other states. In fact, yesterday uh, I had an hour-ish conversation with my counterpart in Iowa. 
And so we were talking about COVID and, you know, we'd never met before. I just reached out and I said, Hey, you know, like I'm trying to figure this out. I'm, I'm new. You're new. Let's <laughs> right. talk, you know? And so we had a great conversation. And so, uh, yes, we're building those bridges across states really cool. because we face the same issues, mm -hmm. right? With one another, we have the same funding sources and mm -hmm. all of those things from a national perspective as well. Um, I think that Oklahoma has an opportunity to be a, a national leader in lots of places and it, just in my world, I don't know about the rest of them, but in my world we do. And so we're building those relationships with our federal partners right. at the highest level now. They look at us as thought leaders. So um, uh, we have a, we've had an opportunity with the director of TANF in DC, which is one of our major block grants. And um, he is, in, we've become sort of like, you know, texting buddies, you know, like I'm like, hey, what's, you know, here's this thing. And he's like, yeah, it's a great idea, whatever. And so um, he has asked us to be a part of a study. So Oklahoma County is now a part of a um, research study with San Diego County, the only two counties in the country that is all about reforming the social safety net. And so this is part of his passion. So he saw us in the That's state of Oklahoma cool. and said, we, we need your input on this. So uh, that wraps up, I think, in September. And, uh, and then we'll have, so we'll have all that data. And now we're going to see what we can do with it. So, so talk to us about emergency SNAP. What is it? Mm -hmm. Let people know what, what it's, uh, yeah. the ideation behind that and what it does for Oklahoma. And start at the beginning. Give us the, what, what, is, what is the background for, for SNAP? Yeah, so, so SNAP is um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, right? So that's food, what you would call food stamps, right? And so um, we, we provide uh, 380,000 um, families with, with SNAP uh, every single year. That's about 800,000 people, individuals. And uh, it's a, one of our core missions as an agency is to provide uh, food resources for our families and communities. Well, during um, this time, of course, there is a significant amount of food insecurity. I mean, we see, um, you know, the economic impact of COVID and what's happening mm -hmm. and people losing their jobs and all those really horrible things. Right. And it's really an important side note. Um, when people use the word economy and talking about COVID, I, I don't think we as leaders talk about what that really means for our communities. Um, an economic impact does not mean money for people. It means um, a, the a lesser economy is hunger and homelessness and suicide rates and you know uh, social determinants of health, I mean health falling through the floor. It's, it impacts our minority communities more than any other. And so these are real issues and these trade-offs, I mean the, de the decisions that are being made in our communities from a state level and a federal level are so difficult because we are way, unfortunately, you're, 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 you're having to weigh the decision between a health emergency and generations of additional poverty. I mean, how, how is oh. that? And it's a really difficult conversation to have. So um, it, with regard to SNAP, so we're able to, to, to help families, you know, in lots of different ways, and one of them is, is food stamps. And so um, we, I think what Samantha was referring to is this, um, this, this funding resource that came from the federal government recently that the state had not uh, been able to pursue because of some uh, hurdles in data collection mm -hmm. uh, is a partnership with uh, the State Department of Education and Joy Hoffmeister. Um, she said, "Hey, um, we're not be we're not able to get to get this money, and it's like 150 million dollars." And so um, she came to us and we said that, and and we just brought our teams together. Another fantastic illustration of when these massive organizations um, intentionally work together we can solve significant problems. So we came together within days. We had all of the data issues figured out between us. It's really the way it's distributed in schools is kind of how it works, why the education is involved. But we have to apply for the waiver. And within just like four or five days, my team had built the new waiver program. She, her team had fine-tuned the data resources. We went together and went to FNS and said, here's our new waiver request that had been denied, you know, three weeks before, a month before, and we got approved. So now, I mean, like not a, a week ago, uh, our teams wrapped it up, and now we have like $150 million for kids who are food insecure. Pretty crazy. That's awesome. That so is awesome. these are stories that are so impactful. And you all having this podcast is an opportunity for us to tell these That's stories right. Right. That, of these agencies who are so well-intentioned. Right. And are now so, I mean, so deeply working together. And, and you know, something else we talked about we, uh, as the podcast goes on, we want to have you back on again. Yeah. And oh, yeah. Another time we, we thought about the idea, we wanted to have maybe a caseworker on uh, with you and, and give that perspective as yes. well, because that's going to be. <laughs> I'll embarrass her, but Alicia unique. in Oklahoma County, she would be great. That's Alicia. the hero. 
that I walked in with Child Protective Services, right. she would be right. Write it down. I got we're, some more to have you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's I mean, I got, we on. got six thousand incredible people yeah. that, that would be great representatives. So, so you mentioned heroes a couple different times. So yeah. when you were growing up, like what, what did that look like for Justin? Like who were Ooh, your heroes? Wow. Okay. So I grew up. Um, we just come off the Last Dance, right? The ESPN series on on Michael Jordan. Oh, yeah. So so I was a basketball. I love basketball. And I played soccer as well. Uh, I, I love both of them. And uh, so from a public perspective. Uh, grow, growing up, I was a, I was a Michael Jordan fan for sure. Um, I had um, lots of heroes personally. Um, I have an incredible mother; like she is, like it, uh, just a, an incredible hero in my life. Her her father, my grandfather, uh, was a World War II veteran, flew oh, so cool. F4U Corsairs, landed on aircraft carriers. Uh, just one of those Renaissance man kind of guys, yeah. a business guy in Oklahoma City. He started the Oklahoma City Blazers, the hockey team. Really? Yeah, so. Oh, that's kind of um, cool. Yeah, so. He learned um, all kinds of things. It, oh, wow. Yeah. And so, um, it, it, I'm telling you, there, there are lots of people. It, what what that those experiences, as well as my time with DHS, has really shown me is the incredible impact that one person can make on another person's life, hmm. right? And you, you may not even know that you made that impact, um, but – but man, we have such an opportunity to, to do that, and, and uh, we can't sell ourselves short. One person can totally make a difference in their community. That's good. One last question, and it goes uh, back to kind of the, co- uh, the COVID topic mm-hmm. again. As, as, and we don't know what the timeline is, of course, but as DHS and OMS, and Steve, actually, I'd like your thoughts on this too. As, as the agencies get back to normal, whatever normal is, uh, what does that look like, um, Justin? I'll turn this over to you first, and mm-hmm. then Steve, I like your thoughts as well. What does normal look like back as these agencies start getting uh, rolling again outside of COVID? Yeah. Uh, mentality? So we're going to make data-driven decisions um, on how we actually interact with with each other and with our customers. Mm-hmm. So for a while there, we stopped all visitations. I mean, we were as cautious. I mean, we so we run Adult Protective Services and Aging Services, right? Mm-hmm. Those are serving some of the most vulnerable right. people in the state of Oklahoma with regard to the virus itself. So as we understand more data and we see trends going in the right direction, and we have, we started opening up those family uh, visitation opportunities that we have right. to reunify families because that's our mission. Uh, so there will be, uh, certainly those will open up. Uh, let's, let's, we'll talk and assume that um, sort of COVID is behind us. Right. And so if it's behind us, I think we are um, sort of past the point of no return on uh, telework and, and modernized work environment. So, so you see that part of it maintaining. Absolutely. Okay. That's, that's an efficiency opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have to be really good at, at um, building connections with one another in mm-hmm. that. That's my biggest fear in telework is in our agency, we have, we're a human services agency. So we um, have this like sort of a support network within our offices. So if you're in child welfare and you've just made a tough decision and you need to go, you need to talk to somebody about it, um, you don't go home and talk about that, right? right. First, confidentiality issues, of course. Right. Um, secondly, we all have this line between work and home life, you know, uh, those two things. Right. And so you, you, you go back to your unit in child welfare and you talk about what just happened. Um, emotionally, you talk about it and mechanically around how you're going to solve the problems for those families. Mm-hmm. So when you go remote, if you go completely remote, how do you preserve that emotional connection that's mm-hmm. required for job satisfaction and, and to make sure you're making, candidly, making the right decisions for families? Mm-hmm. These are sounding boards for one another. So That's, that's interesting because your service that, that your agency provides, and, and we talked about that end employee who's actually out there serving – there's a level of emotions to, to that that really is unique to DHS, mm-hmm. and that, that I never even thought about that. But that's a huge yeah. component to if this. If you're remote doing working. it right, there is. Wow. Oh, I mean, good right? point. Like, right. Yeah. Like absolutely. You should have emotional attachment to this hmm. to, to this job, right? Um, you have to be able to let it go at times, but 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 you're we're here to to like literally save lives, and and if you're not emotionally connected to that, yeah. you're in the wrong job. You probably are, and. Um, so anyways, the new normal for us is, you know, committed to telework long term, right. but we have to solve a lot of problems there. We have to we have to make sure we're building that social connection point for all of our employees. Um, with regard to working with our customers, um, we're here to serve and our workforce wants to continue to serve. And in, in, in fact, in the last just few days, we've had deep conversations around protecting our employees, which is critically important, right. and our customers. And now that we're having a, an uptick in COVID cases, mm-hmm. how do we yeah, how do right. we respond to that? 
and our employees are, I, I keep using the word, I got to come up with another word besides heroes, but they are heroes because, in, and one illustration is, they don't want to stop seeing their customers. They're, they're like, I will go out, give me, a, give me an N95 mask and I'm out, right? Mm-hmm. And so we're equipping them with, of course, we have been equipping them with right. all of those, um, those needs. That's cool. But, um, but, but, but it's cool that you have employees that are so willing to serve. And that's incredible. That, that really is just amazing. I think it breaks the, that paradigm that's out there about state employees in general. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I took this job, uh, a lot of people in the private sector, are like, what are you doing? I mean, mm-hmm. you're not going to have the talent. You're not going to you're gonna have people that are just trying to do barely 40 hours and go home. They're not really affecting change. That has not been my experience. My not experience has been it's the opposite. They hmm. just, at OMS, we just needed to find the right ways of turning people loose, yeah. getting out of their way, give them a little bit of framework, and they want to do great things. I think your agency is, is, is also um, – a great example of that. Absolutely. So, so Steve, you. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was only going to uh, to agree with you completely. the The workforce in state government, like my understanding, fifteen months ago of what a state employee was, is completely wrong. One hundred and eighty degrees off. It was completely ignorant. Now I know what that means, and I am nothing but a pure and deep advocate for state employees. 100%. Yeah, that is awesome. So, Steve, talk a little bit about. Obviously, I get to see the movement a lot about where OMES is moving, but there's a lot of change going on with OMES. Can you kind of talk to that, what the normal looks like for OMES? Yeah, that's hard to define. I mean, so because I don't know what normal is going to be. I yeah, mean, that's true. That's there's it's a moving uh, variable almost every day. I'm an advocate of change. I actually stole something you said early on that I heard you say, which was be fearless for change, which is absolutely who we are. So mm-hmm. um, OMES is 100, not 100%. We're about 98% telework now. That's going to continue. We're not forcing anyone back in the offices. Mm-hmm. We have... As you've been doing over at DHS, our facilities, we have done a lot in terms of uh, cosmetics so that when people are there, it's more collaborative um, uh, than it was. It was brighter. We want them to be there when they're there. But at the same time, we're looking to uh, build more collaborative space, more hotel cubes. In terms of how we serve people, uh, that's been interesting, too, because we're going to continue our mission of getting out of people's way. Like OMES has been regulatory for so long, and statutorily, there's some things we have to do in that Mm -hmm. space, like central purchasing, for example. But... It doesn't mean we need to be a roadblock. We need to be a partner. Uh, we need to be an advocate for the 189 agencies and affiliates we serve. And we're trying that in a couple of different ways. So we're going to continue to build the CTO program out of ISD. We're going to continue to put um, and recommend that everyone, like a Justin Brown or other directors that have executive teams that are running multi-billion dollar agencies, that they have what the resources they need at the executive level, right? And we're not going to get in the way of that. We'll help make our recommendations. And then we want to partner with them. We can't scale and we can't be an expert on all those 189 right. items. So we're going to hopefully bring good partnerships with other vendors and, and third parties that can come in and let them accomplish their mission. I mean, a, a big part of what success looks like for me and OMS is that, man, if you can play a role, a small role or a large role, depending on what the issue is, and helping you know people like uh, Director Brown and others be successful, it's crazy. Um, but our new normal is just... Um, what the rest of the world, I think, has been doing for a long time. Like I come, I'm a 31 year tech guy. Global, you know, I've had global roles, and I was just used to that. You you get used to some of those aspects around the technology and the video conferencing, but it does not replace the human interaction. Yeah. And there's a balance there. Um, the other thing that that is going to be net new for OMS, I think, is uh, I, I care more about how people think than I care about the position, the title, things like that. And we're looking for uh, ways, like I've been talking to a lot of our employees that have been coming back in the building slowly. Um, I've left that up to the directors. We want to continue to empower that. But what I'm looking for, what are other things that we can do um, uh, in terms of uh, operating, implementing, ideation, and how do we turn that loose right. on a larger scale? Here's an example of what that looks like. Think about adjudication. Mm-hmm. So when, when COVID hit, and we've got multiple agencies that have to do adjudications. You're one, OASC is another, tax has to do some of that. Everyone does it on their own. What if we built a virtual adjudication center and how would we do that? Well, you know, um, I come from a world that we had that. Same thing with uh, ad- uh, being able to identify or verify um, people's identities. Yeah. Same kind of thing. We need, uh, I want OMS to be in a position to recommend, work with, finding bi- better business processes. BPO is a big, big thing at OMS now. Um, when Shelley Zumwalt, who just became interim director of OESC, mm-hmm. I hired her for that reason, uh, not just for the um, public um, affairs stuff, but to help us build that innovative innovation in uh, BPO. Now that she's moved on, um, Jerry, Brown, uh, Jerry Moore and I are looking at how we do that. Well, that's coming into this new fiscal, given that you and I and the rest of the directors and the agencies have 
shortfalls in budget that we're having to deal with. Well, the best thing we can do is, is figure out how we get out of faxing. How do we get out of, you know, I mean, just crazy stuff like that. And that's like, the, that's a low hanging fruit. Full disclosure, I, I didn't know how to fax before I started working. At well, so now, you weren't missing. And now anything. Steve's taught you. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> yeah. I just continue that culture. That's great. <laughs> no, seriously. So we can get out of those things and, and end up, you know, providing value in a different way than we have. So we're um, if, if someone's at OMES, they got to like change because we're constantly doing that, and that's it's great. on purpose because you're changing, your team changes, the the, the problems that you guys are solving change. Uh, we asked a question earlier about, you know, what's on the horizon that could be a potential threat or an issue. There, that We have that across everyone, and COVID-19 has brought some yep. of that. It's not just a health issue. Right. There's a lot of fear out there from people just interacting, wanting to come to work about what they don't want to do. It, it's, you know, the CARES Act is great, but some of the, the programs have created challenges for people in the, in the private sector where no one wants to go back to work until mm -hmm. July 31st because they're going to make more money versus they go back in the office. And there's So what's that do? Well, that creates... Um, that creates maybe some tendencies for people at times to feel like, you know, maybe it gets harder to want to go to work, maybe to be inspired to go create. I'm looking for people to change the world. So what our new normal looks like is we're going to find those folks and we're going to turn them loose. And then, then we're going to get to kick back and drink, you know, I don't know, milkshakes or something. <laughs> Toast and milkshakes. Absolutely. But, but I will say this. Um, you guys have been amazing partners. You have since, uh, since I've got the state government, which is all whopping nine months. I'm barely, barely behind yeah. you, but... Um, it, it's, but it shows uh, our relationship with our agencies have done, for, plus what you've done with a Department of Education and others, what state government can be. And I think you and I and others like us, when Governor Stitt got here, there was this whole wave of change. Well, COVID hasn't stopped that. And he's a very data and fact guy. You are as well. I think we've surrounded ourselves more with folks that are more um, looking to use data. And so we're the same. Getting to that data, you know, is, is challenging at times. But again, it's yeah. on the horizon for us. We're going to be data centric. So right. um, there's there's a lot to unpack there. I know, but it's uh, not to take all your time because it's been. Oh no, it's great. Know. How can you not be inspired by that? I'm and all it's, in. That's what I'm talking about. That's right. So one of the things you talked about there is uh, empowering, like DHS or other yeah. other agencies, to accomplish their vision. And we're here to serve, right? OMES is just here to be a service to those who are serving Oklahomans, right? That's our, that's our agency motto, serving those who serve Oklahomans. And just going back to it, that's why we're doing this podcast, so that we can promote Justin and Justin, what you're doing at DHS and what your claims workers are doing, you know, because they're doing amazing things. Mm. And a lot of times they don't get the recognition that they need, uh, sorry, or that they deserve is probably the Absolutely. better way to say that they, because they definitely deserve a lot of recognition for just being the people that they are in serving Oklahomans. So, well, man, appreciate you coming over. Absolutely. Appreciate hey, doing this never, right out I, of the gate. Help us with this. I'm honored. Thing. I told you at the on, offset or outset, I was honored to be on the, on the podcast. And so we want to have you back and some of your crew. I think that'd be a blast. And, Absolutely. And honestly, if there's any stories you want to highlight as we go forward, we're going to be doing these weekly to biweekly. Um, as long as the content is good and, uh, and we're open to, to any any story you want to come tell. That's cool. right. So, Absolutely. Anything you want to close with, Holmes? Yeah. Thank you so much again for being here. And thank you uh, if you're listening at home or, or at work. Um, it's just an op awesome opportunity to learn more about DHS, about uh, Justin, everything you have going on, and mo learn more about your employees and how awesome they are. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving forward, like you mentioned with these next episodes, we're going to be looking at a whole array of different uh, areas of state government. Also, other areas of private sector that are just serving Oklahoma. So stay tuned for that. We'll be having more episodes of that uh, soon. And uh, beyond that, Justin, unless you got anything else to add? No, just thanks for your partnership, guys. Oh, Always. can I ask you really? one more question? Of course. Actually, okay, I've heard a rumor, and I need you to uh -oh. verify this or not verify this. Uh, with this whole work from home thing, um, I hear that you have a dog Oliver who jumps in your lap <laughs> oh, and I want I want <laughs> we, we have to talk about Oliver I before do. we go because I'm hearing that he makes an appearance in just about every web uh, he, web he meeting does that you have. and the timing is never good <laughs> but um, he is a golden doodle he's two years old just a fantastic dog but he uh, he loves to like just come in and then sort of prop up here like he stands up and he just wants he just wants some some love, he's right? A lap dog, I mean, man. absolutely. That's what yeah, he absolutely. is. And some so. cover time. <laughs> he, he does. Yeah, so he's somewhat uh, famous. Well, uh, how my about son this? is getting that way too. I'll tell you this real quick story as we go. Out. Yes, please. But my son is 11 now. When he, he was 10 when this this happened, but uh, they were out of school uh, at the end of or because of the COVID deal, and he comes upstairs and I'm on a call and uh, fortunately it was my team, so you know he came and he was sitting there and he and he had uh, done this poster. 
And it's a picture of a guy. It's a big poster board. A picture of a guy said, you know who this is? And I said, no. He said, this is the guy who invented homework. And then he did this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was that so mad awesome. because he was having to do homework and everything from the house. That that's is awesome. awesome. That's so, good. So that's, that's really the good. sort of stuff that we're all fighting <laughs> in this new well, world. Well, how about this? Let's all make a deal right here. So well, next yeah. time we'll bring on some of your, you know, your uh, claims workers, thing like that. Yeah. The episode after that we'll have you on. We'll bring on Oliver. Hey. He can he can sit right next to you. Oliver <laughs> and Ford, my son. And oh, we'll, I love that. Oh, yeah. Let's thing, have thing, right? bring yeah. them all. Absolutely. Let's, let's go. See, we're already ep- planning episode 50 and, and 99 there. Yeah, you guys are strategic things. <laughs> love it. Look, well, thank, director, thank you so thanks, much man. again hey, for being here. Uh, and if you're listening uh, at home or at work, I guess we'll see you soon with uh, another episode of the Get Stuff Done podcast. Thanks, right. guys. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.